we'll talk a little bit about EFF Austin history and say a little bit about the question of hierarchy when we get into that. That's in the bottom. Yeah. That thing's sensitive. Here we are. P. Kennedy. And by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I'm John Lipkowski. And I uh, have a long association with the EFF Austin going back to the original board of directors uh, when we formed the organization at about, I think 1991, maybe even 1990, we had our first, uh, the big picnic at Steve Jackson Games. Again, I'll talk about history <clears throat> in a bit. But Pete Kennedy, would you like to come up, Pete? <laughs> Pete Kennedy was the attorney on the Steve Jackson Games case. And uh, it's kind of an historic case. It's a case that uh, EFF sort of built its reputation on. And actually, I have, uh, well, here, I've got it around here. I found some things online. For instance, here is an announcement. It says, uh, on March 1st, 1990, the United States Secret Service nearly destroyed Steve Jackson Games an award-winning publishing business in Austin, Texas. In an early morning raid with an unlawful and unconstitutional warrant, agents of the Secret Service conducted a search of the SJG office. When they left, they took a manuscript being prepared for publication, private electronic mail, and several computers, including the hardware and software of the SJG computer bulletin board system which was called Illuminati Online. Odd to be raided by the Illuminati. <laughs> Yet Jackson and his business were not only innocent of any crime, but never suspects in the first place. The raid had been staged on the unfounded suspicion that somewhere in Jackson's office there, quote, might be a document compromising the security of the 9-11 tele telephone system. So this is the background for the Steve Jackson Games case, and it was, Pretty chaotic at the time. Steve had no idea why he was being raided. He was totally confused about it initially. It took him a while to get an explanation and to find out exactly what was going on. Uh, coincidentally, Mitch Kapoor and John Barlow and John Gilmore and uh, a couple other guys were at the same time forming the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And the formation of the Electronic Frontier Foundation really started as a germ of an idea in Barlow's head when he had uh, a kind of online jam on the well, which got published in Harper's uh, Magazine, by the way, uh, with uh, a couple of hackers and a couple other people, and they were kind of talking about the whole thing about the, this new sort of data culture that was emerging and how there were people who could hack in and grab things and had fun doing that, and it was kind of like a panty raid or something like that. You'd go in and steal a document right now and say, look what I got. Uh, and Barlow was thinking, these guys are gonna get in a whole lot of trouble because the cops don't understand that they're really just kidding around, that they're not really serious. And that's what first got him started thinking about how we're kind of on this frontier where the laws are not very well established and the people who are responsible for enforcement to the extent that they know anything about it uh, know very damn little. And uh, something's got to give, right? So the Electronic Frontier Foundation was started to clarify, uh, to have projects to clarify uh, the law and also to defend people who were in danger of being crushed by the law. And the Steve Jackson case was like a perfect case, uh, the perfect case for them to take on. And it just happened that Mike Godwin who had just been hired as EFF counsel and just showed up at the EFF offices, had come straight from Austin, where he graduated from law school here. <clears throat> and uh, Bruce Sterling, and Bruce Sterling and I and a few other people were all on a, a bulletin board uh, here locally for science fiction fans. And it's one of the first places Steve went to talk about what was going on and said, what the hell's, you know, what's happened? Why is Illuminati down? Um, so Sterling got a package of information about what had happened and sent it off to Godwin, and Godwin was also picking it up because he was still logging in. Um, and EFF caught it right away and uh, adopted it as their first 
big case, and Pete can say more about what happened at that point. Sure, I don't need the mic. Do I? I, I, I hate mics. Um, <laughs> A couple things. My, my public service announcement is uh, the beer that has no label on it, I made. Uh, and there is a stout and an IPA back there, both of which I'll recommend. A little, little cloudy, but you get that from homebrew, so help yourself on those. Um, and then I guess the first guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, lose your audience right away. <laughs> yeah, but they'll, be much, they'll be much friendlier. <laughs> Um, so this story, the story starts in 1988, and I'm looking around, at least hoping that everybody in here was at least born by 1988. Right? <laughs> it, it don't, yeah, some of you guys would be close. Uh, and not only, otherwise you know, I shouldn't be having the beer. Yeah. <laughs> not only have I did I get married and have kids in the course of this case. The kid I had is now home from her first year at Rice. Um, one I've had while the case was going on. So this is a bit ancient history. For me, it's kind of my 15 minutes of fame, sort of undeserved fame. Uh, I got involved in the case not because I was a pioneer uh, for you know electronic communications, but largely I was in the right place at the right time. Um, the lawsuit was really was put together by some very high quality civil rights lawyers in Boston and in New York. And when they were ready to file the suit, the suit needed to be filed here in Austin. And they found uh, at the time, uh, my boss, Jim George, was pretty much recognized as the best First Amendment lawyer in Texas at the time to be local counsel. I was fortunate enough to be sort of his bag carrier at the time uh, and got to work on uh, any number of interesting cases that came to Jim. Uh, I have 15 minutes of fame in, in slivers of different areas, uh, including like stories I can tell about having spent two days with Tupac Shakur in jail because he'd gotten sued and other interesting First Amendment cases. You know, things I haul out to sort of maintain credibility with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> but it, through sort of a, a series of coincidences and events, and partly because I was younger and a little more comfortable with computers than Jim was, uh, by the time the case was ready to go to trial, it had sort of devolved on me. And so I did have the fortune of becoming the lead trial lawyer when the case went to trial. So I learned a lot about it. I sort of learned how to tell the story, uh, and you know, am fairly familiar with the law that was presented, what the results were, uh, and then the appeal of the case. But it is a very unique sort of Boston story, uh, where you know, and John had given some of the beginnings of it. But it, it's kind of a neat tale to tell. It didn't start in Austin at all. Really, the story starts uh, in Georgia, where Bell South, one of the baby bells, you know, suffered a intrusion into its computer system where someone broke into the system and copied as john had said a 911 911 back before 911 had any other meaning than 911 a document uh, that was essentially a bureaucratic document describing how the 911 system operated nothing confidential all the information was available in publications that were sold by bell south even but they were sort of upset about the break-in, and they, in turn, turned to uh, Bell Technologies, which was a research arm of the Baby Bells, and a <coughs> investigator at Bell Technologies started investigating these hacking incidents. He, in turn, got the U.S. Secret Service interested. Believe it or not, the U.S. Secret Service has overlapping jurisdiction with the FBI to investigate domestic uh, domestic computer crimes. They're not very good at it, but they had 40 of the time to do it. And they in turn got a, an ambitious <laughs> assistant U.S. attorney in Chicago interested in the case. And I suspect, although I couldn't prove it, that he thought he was going to make a name or a career for himself by prosecuting you know, this sort of new type of crime of computer hackers. And the investigator from Bell, uh, Bell Technologies, Bellcore, uh, tracked this 
administrative bureaucratic 911 document to a number of bulletin board systems around the country. And really this is pre-internet, or at least before the internet was available to anybody other than the federal government or universities. So you had people around the country operating dial-up bulletin board systems which were networked to each other through either short, you know, local or long distance telephone calls. And they found this 911 document included in a hacker <coughs> newsletter called FRAC. And, and FRAC published these scalps, as John said, uh, at times where hackers had, had found documents on systems they had compromised and used FRAC as a bragging rights to say, Ooh, look what I got. And an edited version of the 911 document showed up in FRAC, where uh, the editors had actually gone through and a very little bit of information. And there's Ed Cavazos, who worked with me as a law clerk uh, during the case, uh, and now knows way more than I do about technology law. But I still get to tell the story because I'm old. <laughs> uh, and the editors had actually redacted anything that could be possibly confidential phone numbers or things before they published it, which showed that these guys really were not particularly malicious folks, and published it on the newsletter. And the investigators found the newsletter in several places, one of which was on a bulletin board system operated by a guy named Lloyd Blankenship, who was here in Austin. And Lloyd went by a you know, Game of Thrones sounding handle. He was Eric Bloodaxe, right? Lloyd. No, he was the mentor. He was the mentor. <laughs> That's right. Eric Bloodaxe was the guy who downloaded the document. Yeah, yeah, much yeah. yeah. so Eric Bloodaxe and then the mentor, maybe maybe more of a Dungeons and Dragons name. <laughs> uh, so the Belcourt guy in New Jersey finds the 911 document on Lloyd Blankenship's bulletin board system. They find out that Lloyd works for Steve Jackson Games, an Austin company. They put two and two together and come up with five and decide if Lloyd works at Steve Jackson Games, and Steve Jackson Games has its own bullet board system, mysteriously named the Illuminati, <laughs> uh, then there must be bad things happening at Steve Jackson Games as well. So the prosecutor in Chicago, on the basis of affidavits from the Belcor uh, investigator, and then some affidavits from U.S. Secret Service agents who really weren't doing anything but regurgitating facts, supposed facts that they had gotten from the Belcor investigator, obtained a search warrant here in Austin to go and search not just Lloyd's house, where he had a computer, he operated his bulletin board system, but also the Steve Jackson games business process. <laughs> and the early morning on some on business day in February of 1990, they, the, the, using Austin police, uh, university police, I think, were involved for some reason because Lloyd was a part-time student at UT, uh, and FBI executed one of these gun-drawn, dramatic, you know, you know, entries into both Lloyd's house and the business. There's a funny story about that actually. That Lloyd was standing with these guys. They like were essentially busting him at his house, and he hears them talking over the radio to the people who are at Steve Jackson Games and have a battering ram, and they're about to batter the door down. <laughs> and he says, "No, no, I've got a key. Let me open the door." <laughs> uh, and and force their way in, well, force their way in through, you know, threats of physical violence, uh, are told that Steve Jackson Games is a game company, it's a publishing company. Uh, ignore that. Uh, this is early morning, so there's only a few employees there. Uh, and get access to the premises, deny access to any of the employees, and then, you know, do a top to bottom search of the business. And you know, and this was, you know, 1990s game company, and so it was in a kind of ramshackle building with a ramshackle warehouse. Uh, and the Secret Service and the, the FBI sort of forced their way into all sorts of uh, locked cabinets, seized a whole bunch of materials, including the computer that Floyd used in his <laughs> and including the bulletin boards or the computer that operated the bulletin board system 
and a whole bunch of floppy disks and drafts of a book that Steve Jackson Games is working on, Lloyd was working on. And if you're not familiar with the company, this is not a, this is not a computer game company. This is an old school, primarily, uh, it's actually primarily a card game company. Their most successful games are, are card games. Um, but they also have a series of role-playing games, similar to Dungeons and Dragons, but a generic universal role-playing system called GURPS, where the same rules can be used to play games in all sorts of different environments. So you can be in space, or you can be medieval, or you can be in the Civil War, and you get little supplements so that you can play the game in these different environments. And the supplement that the company was working on at the time was called GURPS Cyberpunk. Uh, which was a gaming environment based on Bruce Sterling and the others, you know, fiction, science fiction, sort of the cyberpunk science fiction, where you could, sitting around a table, rolling the 12-sided dice, looking at very comp complex rule systems, pretend that you're hacking into computers or plugging the computer into your body or into your you know, body computer interface and play this, but it's very much a gaming system. And at least as, as Steve tells it, when he complained and said, we're a game company, uh, his response from the Secret Service was, no, this is real, this is a handbook for computer crime. <laughs> I mean, literally, you could learn to hack from reading a game manual. And it gives an idea of how, how clueless these folks were, and, and to some extent, how early in, in all of this, uh, all the development of computer communications this was. And so, you know, it was a very damaging rate. Uh, it, you know, the company lost the, all of the work that it put into this new system. They had expected that GURP Cyberpunk was going to be successful. They had to lay off a number of employees. The life of the business was uncertain for a period of time. Uh, Steve had to you know, stop doing what he does best, which is develop games, and he had to start being a manager more. Uh, and it really was something that affected a significant, uh, you know, a, a neat, unique Austin company, which, by the way, is still thriving in, in business here, still uh, independently owned. Uh, my 14-year-old boy <coughs> plays uh, their games, card games, and all. So it's kind of neat. Uh, and so, you know, the EFF comes along. I'm not involved in any of the early stuff, so really get those stories from John, and I can't take any credit at all other than being in the right place at the right time. But I was involved in doing the discovery, and it is a nice experience, an interesting experience, to have the ability to uh, hold your government accountable uh, in a lawsuit and ask questions of investigators and law enforcement <coughs> officers on the road. Because you don't often get to do this. And I was a pretty young lawyer, uh, and you know, sitting across the table from Uzi packing Secret Service uh, agents was a little intimidating. The Justin who killed Kennedy? <laughs> you know, I, they were they were young too, so I should have. But you know, I didn't I didn't want uh, I was making a mad nut. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it was interesting to find out, you know, where I mean, one of the threats was, who was really pushing it. And, and, and this, I think, is something consistent with what we've seen, you know, over the 20 plus years since then, is, you know, who was really the instigator of the investigation? Who was really pushing for this? You know, was it a government-inspired investigation out of concern, real concern to uh, danger to the public, you know, or was this something that was being heavily driven by private <coughs> corporations who were putting cases together and handing them over to the government to vote for shit? And at least in this instance, it was pretty clear that this investigation was drive, driven by private entities and not by the government. I mean, I've talked to both Secret Service agents who were uh, involved in the investigation and they were not capable of understanding what they were doing. Uh, I mean, the affidavits they submitted were clearly based on information that they were given and explained by the Belcor operator. And I'm not even sure the prosecutor really understood what he was doing. Um, and, you know, we had, when we 
we opened the trial, I mean, I got to learn some of these things that, you know, to see one of the best trial lawyers in Texas, and he <coughs> said, look, the affidavit has false statements in it. I mean, the affidavit that the government used to obtain the search warrant to search Steve Jackson Games, it clearly had a whole series of demonstrably false uh, information in it related to Lloyd Blankenship, where he worked, what he did, what his involvement was. Uh, and particularly what the UT cop supposedly had told the Secret Service. And the UT cop, to his credit, when I asked, did you tell the Secret Service this? Did, no. <laughs> well, they just made this stuff up. And so we were able to sort of open the trial, putting the UT cop on the stand first and walk through the search warrant affidavit and said, no. Did you tell the Secret Service this? No. Did you tell the Secret Service this? No. Did you tell them this? And it wasn't just sort of one of my first, uh, one of my first trials. It was one of my first trials. Uh, but it was also one of the first trials of, of Sam Sparks, a federal judge in town. Who, if you guys have been in Austin at any period of time, you'd have heard of Judge Sparks. Uh, he is a uh, Oh, see. There's one other lawyer in here. What, what would you? What would, what, what would? What would be your? Cantankerous. Cantankerous. <laughs> word for independent. Um, and uh, he is ornery. He has high expectations. He, uh, although he is a large extent a conservative Republican, he uh, does not like the big guy picking on the little guy, and he holds the government to high standards. Uh, and. Uh, Joe Sparks was quite upset about what he saw from the quality uh, of the investigation, and he was particularly upset when Steve told the story of after the raid, having gone to the FBI, and I just, I still, this image still hurt, hurts me, my heart, where he went to the FBI with a box of empty floppy disks, and so I said, can I please just copy you know, all of the GURP cyberpunk material so that he can get back uh, back at work at the book. And the FBI sent him away empty handed. And they ended up having to essentially recreate all of the work uh, that they had lost. And in the course of the discovery part of the case, I mean, we have been curious about what the Secret Service did with the electronic communications on the bulletin board system. Now, I mean, not, I mean, y'all probably know better than I do, but you know, these old dial-up bulletin board systems had multiple functions, and one of them was was sort of a broadcast function where you could post material that anyone who goes to the system could read. But they also had you know fairly simple internal email systems where anyone who was a subscriber to the bulletin board system could dial up. Uh, they could leave a private message for another person when that person, the next time they dialed into the system, they could read the private message and email. Uh, it sort of sat instead of moved from place to place, but it was still still email. And we, I mean, Ed, you were involved in finding, you know, we actually, it was a, it was a, uh, a publicly accessible software that ran the bulletin board system. And Ed or somebody found the guy who had actually programmed it. And was it with me? No. WWE free BMS. I saw it was his What was his name? Uh, his name was. Um, I've got, yeah, because I've got a number either. I just saw it. Not only is this a long time ago, I'm now over 50, so I have to <laughs> sort of, of everything. That is not yet. Wayne. Wayne. Wayne Bell. Wayne Bell. Wayne Bell. <laughs> Wayne Bell. Um, and uh, so we actually were able to get Wayne to come and testify, about, not only about how his software worked, but he did uh, a forensic examination of the system after it was returned to Steve from the FBI. And he was able to show that they, either the FBI, or I guess it was the Secret Service, I think had done the investigation, had systematically gone through it and read every single email that was stored on the system. So they hadn't just taken the private messages. But for all 128 users or something that were registered at the time, they had literally gone through and systematically read the content of every one of those messages without the search warrant authorizing it, without probable cause to think any of these people had done anything related to, to the 9-11 document, that 
they were members of Lloyd's Golden Board System or anything. They just went through and read all these private messages. And again, but something EFF did when they structured the case was very smart. They had four of these members were also plaintiffs along with Steve Jackson Gang. Uh, and they sued over exactly that over the seizure of their email and then the invasion of privacy when their private email was read for no reason at all. Uh, and two of them had, you know, your perfect geek story that they had met uh, each other uh, online and on the system, you know, shared their love of role playing games and actually got married uh, over the course uh, of their sort of online romance. And so the married couple were, were two of the plaintiffs. Uh, and then on the ordinary side, Judge Sparks wasn't as impressed with that, but I thought it was a sort of brilliant, a brilliant piece. Um, and so, you know, the, the lawsuit at its core really involved two different pieces. One of it was what level of protection does is the law going to afford now and in the future over these types of private electronic communications? Is it going to treat it like phone calls? Is it going to treat it like U.S. mail? Is it going to treat it like notes passed in the classroom. How's the law going to struggle with this sort of new method of communication where people have at least some expectation of privacy, but maybe it's not even sure how much of an expectation of privacy they have. And then a very different side of it, which is when a company is involved in the business of writing and publishing words, publishing text, publishing books, uh, are there restrictions on the government's ability to just go execute search warrants and seize that material and claim that it's, quote, evidence in a case? Or are there First Amendment or First Amendment-like statutory protections for companies that are involved in publishing that? Uh, and real short, and then I, I don't want to take up too much of the time, it, we were actually successful on, on both sides. Uh, one is, you know, sort of vindicating Steve Jackson's publishing side, where the judge found that the seizure of the GURPS cyberpunk drafts violated a federal <coughs> statute called the Privacy Protection Act, uh, because it's not legal in most instances for the government to use uh, search warrants to seize evidence from publishers. Like, you can't go into the Austin American State to the search warrant and start pulling all of the articles or draft articles from the newspaper. And so Steve Jackson was able to recover actual money damages, you know, to help compensate for the business loss that they suffered from that seizure. Uh, and then we also won, you know, um, more of a sort of a nominal award, but a clear recognition that the seizure and the reading of these private messages sent between people who were not the target of the investigation uh, and for whom there was no probable cause to think they committed any crime was also a violation of you know, federal statutory law, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, and it, it, you know, I, I'm not to say, you know, whether it changed the world too much. The most significant thing I saw in the immediate aftermath is the Department of Justice did to rewrite their handbooks on the method of conducting computer searches and seizures. And there were you know, in the mid-90s, entire sections of how the Department of Justice was advising uh, the federal law enforcement and federal prosecutors about how to conduct computer searches. Uh, lots of nervousness about getting sued, and worse than getting sued, getting embarrassed, uh, again, from that type of investigation. And then before I came over tonight, I ran a, a Westlaw search to see how often the case had been cited. And it's been cited a, at least 114 times in subsequent cases, mostly in federal court, but also in state courts, and then in you know hundreds and hundreds of law review type articles. But you know those do get churned out in enormous volume. Um, and as odd as it is, and this is real law geek stuff, so I won't bore you with it too much. You know, looking at a, a potential case a month or two ago involving not a government seizure, but sort of same issues about levels of privacy in uh, remotely stored electronic communication. And run across that there's still uncertainty in, in at least one area about the level of protection over elect stored electronic communications uh, as to whether them having been read and stored or not read yet is 
significant as to whether or not they're protected under federal law. It still seems to me like a silly answer, um, and one that Sparks got right, you know, twenty something years ago. Uh, but there are still courts trying to trying to figure that out. Uh, but anyway, I just talked more than my fifteen minutes from the fame that I got from from the case. But it, you know, it couldn't have been more fun to you know work with with John and with Mike and, uh, and with Steve, who is you know is a fantastic guy and a huge supporter of civil liberties. Uh, and get a chance for me to sort of stick my foot in there just because I happened to be in the right time, at the right place. And, you know, to some degree, it, you know, it made me be able to pretend I knew something about this area of the law. Uh, and I have been involved in, you know, representing folks, you know, particularly with online communication, you know, you know internet stuff, business and business models uh, since then. Uh, we did it in that way in another lawsuit. Remember the spam, spam suit? Yeah. The flowers.com suit? Oh, that's right. <coughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and I worked with ACLU on a case up in Cincinnati uh, some years after, which didn't have this, this kind of result. So anyway, that's kind of my deal. I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'll talk all evening, but uh, <laughs> other people can chime in if they want. And Ed, you know, I've got some homebrew back there. Too. No, did you? I yeah, have, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the stouter is yeah, it? Is it an imperial stout? No. Just a heavy stout? No, it should, it should be too heavy. Like 60 of them? I just oh, want to repeat, there's lots yeah. of beer back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not strong for a home but that's not. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Peace so, out. Right. Well, maybe, uh, let me come up and talk a little yeah. bit about EFF, and then, you know, if you have questions for Pete, hold them. Uh, we're going to have a couple other, I'm going to talk a little bit about EFF, and then uh, Greg will come up and talk a little bit about a coalition that we have formed. Uh, and actually, I think something Pete just said was relevant to that. He might be able to get that some. Um, <clears throat> so what I've got here in my hand is a press release from, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. This is a press release from July 10th of 1990. It says Mitchell D. Kapoor, founder of Lotus Development Corporation and On Technology, Today announced that he, along with, the, with colleague John Perry Barlow, has established a foundation to address social and legal issues arising from the impact on society of the increasingly pervasive use of computers as a means of communication and information distribution. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, will support and engage in public education on current and future developments in computer-based and telecommunications media. In addition, it will protect, wait a minute, it, it will, I'm sorry, in addition, it will support litigation in the public interest to preserve, protect, and extend First Amendment rights within the realm of computing and telecommunications technology. And then it goes on to talk about the initial funding was from Mitch and from Steve Wozniak uh, uh, from Apple Computers and, uh, and then it goes on to say, the first case concerns Steve Jackson, an Austin-based game manufacturer who was the target of the Secret Service's Operation Sun Devil, which is actu actually inaccurate. It wasn't Sun Devil, it was a different operation, but similar operation. Uh, <clears throat> the EFF is pressed for full disclosure by the government regarding the seizure of this company's computer equipment. And the second action the foundation intends to seek Amicus Curiae, our friend of the court status in the government's case against Craig Niedorf, a 20-year-old University of Missouri student who is the editor of the electronic newsletter Frack World News, we mentioned before. Um, and there's there's kind of more to this. Uh, I, may, I'm, I was digging these out today. I found a, a kind of treasure trove of these things uh, on the well. Uh, <laughs> well the old online community that we were all part of i know ed and i both had accounts there uh bruce sterling and mike godwin and a bunch of us who were like the usual eff suspects at the time uh, so what happened was <clears throat> eff took on the case and we're actually providing funding and uh legal support and so forth for steve and uh at the either first or second, I'm not sure which, conference on computers, freedom, and privacy, which is something that a bunch of us used to go to regularly. I think they're still doing it. Uh, CFP. Um, 
Steve was there, the EFF guys were there, and the EFF guys were talking about their intention to have uh, a community-based organization with chapters, similar to like Sierra Club, you know, local chapters. And Steve said, uh, ideally we should start in Austin. Uh, I'm there and I'm happy to start something. We'll form the first chapter, the Alpha chapter for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And he came back, had a picnic at uh, Steve Jackson Games. Uh, there was a little area outside with a picnic table. And he gathered just about every geek in Austin and showed up for this big uh, picnic and party at Steve's uh, place of business. And Steve climbed onto a picnic table and gave this rousing speech uh, and announced that we were going to start, that he intended to start a local chapter of EFF, something that a lot of us had just learned of within a few months before then. And some people were just learning of it that night. Uh, so that's how EFF Austin started. And that would have been in 91, I think. Um, and uh, this idea of a community-based organization was really, uh, we were excited about it. Uh, and we started talking to some other organizations that had popped up in other parts of the country, like in Georgia and New York. And, I mean, there was kind of any number of places where um, they had what you might call EFF-ish organizations. Uh, the Bay Area, they had one called this group. Um, and in New York, it was the Society for Electronic Access, I think. Um, so um, we started a, somebody, John Porterman, who was part of EFF Boston, started an email list uh, so that we could all start talking about how we were going to put this network of organizations together uh, with EFF at the hub. And uh, fights broke out. <laughs> there was a guy named Jerry Berman who had, had come to EFF. Uh, they were sort of engaging him. He was a former ACLU guy and an activist. And he uh, was convincing them that they really needed to be in DC and lobbying, that they could have the most impact if they could lobby the legislature, the federal legislature. Uh, and Jerry was kind of going along with the community idea initially, but he was also seeing that all of the local organizations were very independent and autonomous and had minds of their own. We were already incorporated separately, you know, we had our own Texas corporation. And uh, uh, Jerry, who was incidentally working, his assistant was Sherry Steele, who now is the director of EFF and is phenomenal. Uh, and they were, you know, they were nice people and we were trying to work it out and having a lot of conversations and so forth. Uh, EFF decided that they needed to bring everybody together face to face at Georgia Tech, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but just got plane tickets and flew out. Uh, were you there yet? I didn't go. You didn't go there? Yeah. Uh, Nick Anderson, I think, went and, and maybe David Smith. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, and we all showed up, had uh, uh, big plans, all excited, everybody sitting around. EFF shows up, all of the board of directors of EFF and all of the staff show up to meet with us. They just come from a retreat and they announced that they had decided not to have chapters. <laughs> and uh, we were test following. And some of the, I realized actually that some of the people were there uh, kind of hoping they were going to get a bunch of money from the EFF, you know, get funded and, and maybe create jobs out of the, the uh, organizations that they were hoping to make. So they were more cuts falling than we were. We were already doing it. We were just out there doing it without any money, really. Uh, we just had talent, you know. We had a bunch of guys on the board. We had a working board, and they. They could do it. We could come up with stuff. We were having uh, meetings, public meetings like this. We were having, starting to have events. Uh, we had an unofficial board member 
who didn't really announce his involvement because he was writing a book. He was working he, as a journalist. He didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to seem to be biased in any way. That was Bruce Sterling. He was working on a book called Hacker Crackdown, which talked about the Steve Jackson raid and Operation Sun Devil and uh, various operations. It's still kind of a great read if you can get your hands on it. Uh, and I think you can get it pretty easily. Why are you laughing, Marcia? <laughs> oh, because we have we don't have any in our garage. <laughs> we have a few. Oh, we <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so this is where it get, got kind of interesting for me because Berman got up in front of us. We stayed, I mean we stayed for the whole meeting. And he said, Well, we're not gonna talk about having chapters, but we're Jerry's going to tell you guys a bit about how to do activism. And, uh, and Jerry got up and said, well, it really kind of doesn't make sense given the philosophy of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We believe in decentralization. Uh, we're kind of libertarian. So it doesn't make sense to us to create this centralized organization with us in the middle of it and have a bunch of chapters. And that's one of the reasons we decided not to do it. But it would make absolute sense for us to have a network and to network all of your organizations that are here and you know effectively do stuff together. We'll just be part of that network. I thought that was a great idea. I still think it was a great idea. Uh, so a lot of those organizations kind of went away, but you now see uh, networks of organizations doing things pretty effectively, maybe less effectively than they should. Um, so the history of EFF Austin after that is that we were kind of our own organization. Uh, we started an arts group, EFF Austin Arts, and had some like interesting cyber art stuff going on. Uh, we got involved in RoboFest. Uh, you may be familiar with the local robot group. They were around then and they had a big event every year called RoboFest. It kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I had a company called Fringeware and Fringeware and EFF Austin and the robot group all got together and jammed and, and put on a couple of RoboFests that were pretty happy. And one of those RoboFests, um, a guy named Doug Barnes, who's now a, a technology attorney in New York. I just saw him up there last week. Uh, really great guy. Uh, really gets fired up uh, and was particularly fired up at the time. He, he wasn't even dreaming of being an attorney at the time. He had been like a systems guy, a systems administrator. And he said, we can build a land for RoboFest. We'll build a land and we'll put this move on it. And uh, uh, we did it. Uh, we got a bunch of computers from Steve Jackson Games and carted them down to uh, the Coliseum, I think is where we were having the event and uh, built a LAN and then built a MOO, a multi-user object-oriented like text-based environment, uh, which was like a text-based virtual reality. Uh, Steve was just beside himself with excitement <laughs> about having a, a, an environment that was like that, this, a virtual reality environment, even though it was described in text, it wasn't graphical at all, but it was pretty cool and there was all kinds of cool stuff happening in there, Steve decided to start a business around it uh, for Metaverse Mood to be part of a business and it sort of made sense that in order for people to be able to connect to the Mood, they would need to be able to log into, uh, onto the internet. The concept of an internet service provider was just sort of starting to appear and make sense. Some of the earliest as far as I know, the earliest small ISP businesses were in Austin. One of them was called Real Time, which all, a bunch of us were on at the time. And then Steve started a thing called Illuminati Online, which became a pretty big internet service provider, national level for a while. And the Moo actually went away. It turned out to be kind of a flop. It was called Metaverse. A guy named uh, uh, Neil Stevenson wrote a book called Snow Crash, where he took the metaverse idea and fleshed it out a bit, if you've read that book. Um, and I believe that's where he got the idea from because Doug Barnes and Neil Stevenson are really good friends. It flopped again when it called when it was called Second Life. <laughs> <laughs> Did it flop? Is it, it's still there. Not much. Not much. Uh, well, 
If you got any lending dollars, you better trade them for bitcoins, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had this like phenomenal history of doing cool things, at, at least through the 90s. Uh, we kind of stopped after the, uh, you may be familiar with the Communications Decency Act and the challenge to it at the Supreme Court. And you know, we all got really behind that in a big way, and there was a lot of energy expended by us and ACLU and all these kinds of groups. Um, and uh, we won. I mean, we, we got the, the decency part of the Communications Decency Act was rescinded. Some of the acts still exist, but it's good stuff, not bad stuff. Um, so we sort of. I don't know. Felt like we had won the battle and went off. And of course, if you look around, you know we hadn't. In 2001, we revived the organization and we've been uh, kind of rattling along since then. And we've done a bunch of interesting things. Uh, every now and then, we'll just do a big event. One of the latest Maggie organized. Uh, in fact, she was the auteur. She actually created this thing as a work of art. Cyberpunk uh, 2014, uh, which was, we called it a cyber, Cyberpunk Retro Fest. Retro Fest. <laughs> yeah, which is like nostalgia for the 90s, you know? A great event that we did here in South by Southwest this year. Uh, and it was kind of reflective of the arts events that we used to do and some of the robot group stuff that we used to do. We've had parties at South by Southwest almost every year for the longest time. Yeah. What, what uh, year range was, were the art things? I'm interested in that. I didn't even know about all that. EFF yeah, Austin Arts mm -hmm. was probably from 93 to probably 97. Maybe 93, it might have started in 92. Uh, 93 was a pretty big year though for that. We had a bunch of people in town who it just happens were um, had very interesting perspectives on the internet. There was a guy named Marcus Novak who uh, uh, did a lot of work on virtual space. He's, he was an architect, but he thought in terms of how spatial metaphors work on the internet. And then Sandy Stone, you may all know her, was at the university and started the interactive media lab there called ACT Lab, uh, which was uh, uh, a big force in sort of like alternative technology thinking uh, in Austin and actually on a global scale. She was a whole other place and she still has an act lab in Switzerland. Uh, she's retired from UT now and is uh, living in Santa Cruz. Uh, but she was part of that. Um, Vernon Reed, a guy who made cyber jewelry uh, and he was still around. He's teaching gaming at ACC number of people and then Ed put on these uh, uh, sysop liability workshops which were pretty cool. Uh, one of them, uh, we lured a bunch of people away from the Super Bowl for one of those, right? <laughs> Good time. <laughs> <laughs> so we were doing that too, we were doing policy stuff. So basically there's a history of EFF Austin doing a lot of good work and lately, uh, everybody's busy. It's really hard for us to get around doing it, but it's important. We're, you know, we, we alternate between being tired and being fired up, uh, but we really need to be fired up. And we need to be thinking about what we can do about the issues du jour because some of them are pretty painful. The big, the big ones today are obvious, like surveillance is a big deal. Um, uh, the question of the future of the internet, the question of net neutrality, those are a big deal. We can actually focus on these two issues, privacy and the state of the internet and net neutrality. Uh, those are pretty big issues, and if we talk about nothing else but those two, then we've got our plates pretty full, and there's a lot we can do. So, um, last year, um, Greg and I and some people we know, actually they approached us uh, and said that uh, they wanted to do some work to try to get some privacy legislation passed. And that led to the formation of the, what we call Tex Epic, TX 
EPC, which is the Texas Electronic Privacy Coalition, which is Aust uh, EFF Austin, ACLU, and TAG, and who else? Seems like the one out of Grits. Grits for breakfast. Oh. Grits for breakfast, yeah. <laughs> right, Grits for breakfast, criminal justice blog. Uh, it was Scott Henson of Grits for Breakfast that actually approached us and, and got us moving on that. And Greg, this would be a good time for you to come up and talk about TXEPC and the privacy work we're doing. Um, and we're, we're still chugging along on that. Sure. Um, so thank you, John. That's true. I always enjoy hearing John talk about this, uh, this history because it's so fascinating and like I myself actually wanted to come to Austin as a result of um, the gaming companies that were here, including Steve Jackson Games and stuff. So um, all of that initial history of the event was kind of before my digital awakening in some sense. So it's great to be friends with John and to um, have access to such an incredible uh, re resource. Like John is, his last name is Lukowski. I like to say he's the internet dude. Big, 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 big. So John knows everybody. Um, so specifically about the Texas Electronic Privacy Coalition, um, we have been leaning more the last few years into actually doing policy work, um, actually doing some lobbying up at the state capitol. Um, so this last legislative session, uh, we actually were up there working on geolocation privacy for the data on our mobile devices and as well on uh, warrant protections for the content of your email. And so we got the warrants piece this last session, uh, which is the first in the country uh, to actually require uh, a warrant for access to the content of your email communications uh, for, for law enforcement. Um, and the geolocation piece, um, the session ended about May. Snowden was June 5th, June 6th. I think we might have gotten a little further on that one. Maybe, maybe not. Like, we learned a lot down at the legislature this last session about politics and about the um, many different factors and opportunities there are for derailing one's legislation. And ours, actually, that piece got derailed in the Calendars Committee, which is uh, a body that actually schedules stuff that's come out of committees for a vote on the floor. It's like, oh, well, we got this last check here, apparently, and uh, that's where it got hung up. So anyways, all that stuff is very interesting sort of in some ways and i want to throw out this proposal i think that that kind of work is interesting in the same way that lawrence lessig thinks that code is law another way of looking at that is that law is code because it's words it's words with very particular meanings and if you don't know the definitions of those words then you don't really know what it's doing so it's a way of actually looking at law as something that can be analyzed and understood. So I've offered that as uh, a way of encouraging maybe if you'd be interested in participating with us during this next legislative session, which starts in January. Um, we're going to be working through this coalition like John was saying, ACLU of Texas is a member, Texans for Accountable Government, which is another really good group here in town that's very well organized. Um, if you have libertarian leanings, that sort of thing, TAG's a good group to go check out. Um, also, uh, Texas Civil Rights Project is the other group that's signed up at this time. Um, that was the composition of the coalition for the most part. It's really just a handful of people who went understood and did some actual grassroots activism. Uh, we had the benefit of working with, uh, we mentioned Grits for Breakfast, uh, is Scott Henson. He's uh, just incredibly well-informed person about criminal justice uh, at the state level. 
and um, both he and his partner, Kathy Mitchell, who's uh, my boss, actually, at this reunion, um, are very, very, they're veterans <coughs> of uh, the state legislature and are very good coaches. And so we've been learning from them about all of this. And uh, so, but this next session, we're gonna take that geolocation bill back and we're gonna get that passed. Uh, that one, that one should be straight through the upper it's pretty easy. Um, we're also gonna be looking at stingrays. Have y'all heard of IMSI catchers, cell tower emulators, these sorts of things? Okay, we've got, we've got some folks who haven't heard of these. Um, these are devices, there's a few different companies that manufacture them for law enforcement and military intelligence purposes, these sorts of things. It's like a portable cell tower, and it's, it's a portable pirate cell tower. So it sets itself up as a very, very powerful tower device in a particular geographic location, and everybody's devices connects to it. It's like, oh, well, this is the strongest signal in the area. We'll connect over there. And so then that gives them access not only to all the metadata, but also they can, um, in certain circumstances, decrypt all the content as well and just siphon it up for everyone in a particular area. And um, you know that's kind of par for the course for this entire collect it all mentality about things, which is not particular. Certainly didn't really see the warrant for that one. Um, so. Um, so stingrays are in use, have been in use by law enforcement for at least, I guess, about the last decade or so. And we're starting to find now, um, thanks to some work, most recently ACLU of Florida did some interesting open records work as well as uh, some, um, some litigation to find out that Harris Corporation, which manufactures the stingray, which is the most um, most notorious of the devices, they had actually talked to Florida law enforcement agencies and said, well, here, we're just going to give you this device, which normally costs, mm, we've seen price ranges from 250 to three quarters of a million dollars, sort of thing, from the invoices we've seen from the Houston Police Department and the Fort Worth Police Department. Um, so in Florida, they said, we're going to give it to you, so there's no record of that particular transaction <laughs> and we're going to put you under an NDA which says that you can't tell anyone <laughs> about it including judges that you go to and ask for a warrant to use this particular device so it's hasn't been showing up on anyone's radar apparently for some time because of these NDAs that our police agencies are under it's novel I never, <laughs> never, never have seen that technique before so anyways, that's building some interest in seeing like how much the U.S. Marshals and the Secret Service and the DEA and local law enforcement have been using these devices. So like we said, we know Houston and Fort Worth have these devices and there's a campaign I'd point you to, have y'all ever heard of Muckrock News? Muckrock, it's a group out of Boston. They're trying to build a system to automate the open records process. Um, so like, which the open records process is really simple to use. And if you've never actually filed an open records request, you should just do it to see and prove to yourself that it's really easy. You just send a letter and say, give me this. And that's how it gets started. So, but there's schedules for all of that. And it's, you have to be diligent because otherwise then they'll just shuffle it under the carpet, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so but they're trying to build an automated process for the system where you just go to their site, identify the agency you want to file a request for, and they'll handle all the paperwork for you in some sense, all the labor. So they'll scan the responses they get back, post them online, that sort of thing. So anyways, they have a campaign going where they're gonna actually send out a bunch of FOIA requests as a project to state and local law enforcement about their use of stingrays. They've got a campaign up on Beacon Reader right now. I'd really like to see that come together. So if you have, like this is how good of a fundraiser I am, I'm like, go give money to these guys. <laughs> like, that's maybe part of 
why we never have any resources. <laughs> Anyways, we will pass that. So that's all going on. We're going to work on stingrays, geolocation privacy, and possibly automated license plate readers. So I don't know if y'all are familiar with how often those are used now as well. I'm not going to go into the same lengthy diatribe about them, but suffice it to say that law enforcement and well, government and private corporations have um, systems set up to basically like a camera taking pictures and identifying license plates and geolocating those devices and building huge databases of uh, people's locations, physical locations according to where their car is or where their license plate is or where the image recognition that associates a particular graphical image of, with, I'm sure no errors are ever made with <laughs> that particular process. Um, so, so we've got state and federal and local law enforcement buying these databases from private corporations, which mm, that's all sort of like, well, maybe problematic as far as the retention schedule for that sort of information and what kind of inferences are being made from this sort of data in the same way that what sort of inferences are being made from the metadata from everybody's mobile devices in these rooms. So like, there's all of these things going on these days that indicate to me that an organization like EFI Boston has plenty of work to do. And more than anything, I think we have lots and lots of people and individuals who are out there going, well, yes, we need to do something, but what? Um, I think that's a, a common feeling I have, I know. And um, I think that as the atomized individuals that we are in this particular culture, that's a hard question to figure out on your own. And I think that we're only really going to find solutions to these sorts of problems at that next level of consciousness in some ways by coming together and uh, reinforcing the strength that we have in numbers. So towards that end, I think EFF, National EFF, has also recognized this. I don't know if you've seen uh, several months ago they announced that they are actually going to be um, embracing finally a community organizing model of some sort. They haven't been specific about it yet. April Glazer is the, the activist with EFF that's in charge of that program. Um, but you can go to their website and actually like sign up for their list. Like I haven't just seen anything in response to, to signing up for that yet. I think they're still figuring it out as far as what they want to do. Um, but you know, the last few times that we've uh, run into EFF people, like like we say, would they come down for South by Southwest? We always throw a party together. Um, we saw them at the, the NSA event they had at the University of Texas here recently. And um, whenever we talked to them recently, we're just like, look, you've got to leverage the fact that you're national EFF. Like what we've seen, um, for, for one, is that people assume that we're EFF. We're EFF Boston. They're like, oh, we're trying to frontier foundations here. Well, then, you know, it opens doors for us. And of course, like we're immediate, we're like, no, no, we're EFF Boston, independent group. It's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at that point. The door has been opened. The assumption of um, not only competence, but um, wherewithal has already been made uh, with the folks that you're interacting with, which is very interesting up there at the, at the state legislature. So um, we keep on telling nationally about it. It's like, do this. And you get them yeah, they need to they need to take the lead and so I hope that that's what they're what they're doing um, and what I hope is as they develop their approach that they want to take for local grassroots based university and community organizing uh, that we can play an important part in all of that as kind of the, the local connection for that work so uh, more to come on all of that stuff but you know, want to finally be taking more opportunities like this to say, look, 
Yeah. And I think that EFF is kind of, I mean, they've turned into, they're kind of a policy organization, but a lot of what they do is legal work. And uh, sometimes we describe them as like an activist law firm. Uh, and they have, you know, like any organization, resource constraints. I think they really would like to make that community thing work, but they're going to need help, and we can help them. Uh, what, what, what Greg and I have been learning how to do, we both work at, at uh, Consumer Union, and uh, one of the things we think about is building activists. You know, one of the things we think about there, uh, because the, the best way to be effective in numbers is to try to reach out to people who have affinity with you and who kind of get what you're talking about and have the same concerns and help them to become activists. Help them find a way to make a difference. And what we would like to do, and it's hard because we're, I mean, our board of directors is a set of really super busy people. We don't have staff. We're just a bunch of guys who, uh, uh, we sort we get commissioned and we, uh, we understand there's something that has to be done and we're gonna try to, we're gonna try to do it. But at the same time, we need help. We need to recruit more people to become activists in service of a mission that we think is important. Um, and right now, I can go back to what I said earlier, there's two things going on, privacy and surveillance, uh, the stuff that Greg was talking about. And then the other thing is that the internet is pretty much dead, really. I mean, what we used to think of as the internet doesn't really exist anymore. This, this network of networks, it's like almost a quaint concept now. But <clears throat> given that the context has changed and given that we're in a kind of different world now, we should be thinking about how we retain the values of that system and how we retain that system's, I guess, let me say the capabilities of it, the, that neutrality that we talk about. We keep talking about net neutrality. And a lot of people can think about that technically as whether you are biased in what package you went through or whatever. But what it really means is the freedom to connect to the internet and connect to any part of the internet and have the confidence that you're gonna be able to connect it with reasonable response rate, reasonable speed, uh, that your, the pipes are gonna serve you all well and that there's not gonna be censorship and that there's not gonna be impediments in the flow of traffic. Uh, however, that's technically implemented, you know, I, I don't know that we have to be concerned about that. The ideal thing is what David Eisenberg calls the dumb network, where all the power and, and all the intelligence is at the edges, and the network just moves things around as efficiently as possible. I think it's going to be hard for us to have that totally. I, there's going to be some, there are going to be things like, kind of like fast lanes. Right now what Comcast is talking about, uh, for Netflix, for instance, is con a kind of internal content delivery network. But what it really means is that they're gonna help get Netflix content to Comcast subscribers fast. And that probably means that there's gonna be some bias there, even if it's content delivery network, which is kind of, I mean, that's a technology that's well established, Akamai, et cetera. Um, and it hadn't really screwed with our ability to move data around the network. Of course, the internet always feels a little bit broken, right? But, but we, can, we can access things and we can move the data around. And in fact, a lot of us are finding we're getting higher speed connections and we're able to, I don't know, watch high definition television over the internet. That still boggles my mind a little bit. I, Think back to see you, see me. <laughs> Low res, little squares. So our message tonight is that we really would like for you and people that you know to come to our meetings and join us in our efforts, help us with our legislative work. Uh, one year, uh, we were part of a campaign or a coalition called Save Meeting Wireless. 
where we went down to the uh, legislature and we had like, we must have had a dozen people or so, maybe more than that, who went down there and just walked and walked and walked and went into offices and talked to people. And basically what we were trying to do was to prevent the, there was a, a bit of law that was gonna be changed so that municipalities couldn't have, couldn't like have their own wireless networks and open them up to the public. Uh, years ago, there was uh, a law passed that prevented municipalities from operating like a network. Austin was gonna do this. Austin was gonna have a network that was, they were gonna build out the network uh, and have fiber in the door for every house in Austin and let people lease the network to you know, deliver content. And uh, Southwestern Bell, now at and had an opinion about that and they whispered in some ears down at the legislature and the next thing you know there was a law passed that made it illegal to do that. But there was still a loophole that would have allowed free mini wireless networks to exist and they were trying to close that. And we, uh, we went down there and we lobbied and we lobbied. I don't think our lobbying was what did the trick because actually the, the, that little piece of legislation which was riding in a bigger piece, uh, it got removed, but I think that it was partly because my Bell was making phone calls and Texas Instruments was down there shaking their fist. And there were like high powered attorneys that those guys had working with them who were also talking to legislators and lobbying. But we, were, it, we made something of a difference, and we were there, and we, we were present, and we also catalyzed some of those other responses. Uh, some of those people wouldn't have got involved if we hadn't told them, you know, the issue was there. So there's a lot that we can still do. Now what we should do is, uh, I told you that if you had questions for uh, Pete, or if you have questions for me or for Greg, we can do a Q&A session now. Do we have any ideas as to what to do with these topics, or are we just uh, still at the stage of collecting people and then working to, to gather ideas on action? Uh, maybe does the EFF have any, anything written up? I haven't checked on the website in a while, but suggestions as to uh, action to be taken on any of these topics? Well, a lot of what, I'll say something, I'm not, I'm not very uh, a lot of what organizations do is ask people to sign petitions online or, you know, take some kind of online action. Um, and that may be kind of effective. Uh, what I think we should be doing, though, is putting together some number of people who are willing to go down to the legislature. Well, Jerry, back, I told you about Jerry Berman back in the day. Uh, he became the director of EFF and the director they originally had, who was an online community guy, was out the door. And Jerry Berman came in and they made a DC lobby out of it. And Berman told me one time, he said, You know, the most effective thing you could do is get a bus, load it up with people, and take it to DC and show up. You know, show up, testify, be available for us. So if we could do that sort of thing, and do it, you know, we, we're here in Austin, the legislature is here. If we can do that here, that could be very powerful. We need to find, find the bills or, in, you know, what we did in the last legislature was that we actually uh, helped push a bill along. You know, we suggested the language for it. That's one way to do it. Obviously, that all the time. Um, I, I, think, I think what John's saying is, is pretty excellent, actually. Um, I, I think one of the important parts is just for us to convene people and to provide a place for people who are interested in these subjects or concerned about them uh, to get together and figure out what to do. Um, kind of riffing on the idea that John's presenting there, um, I think especially with EFF National starting to actually organize people locally. Um, the fact that we're in the state capital of Texas, which is a significant state um, in terms of setting precedents for law, um, and as well 
the timing is right in Texas for passing laws that are more privacy aware, perhaps we could even say what's the privacy friendly. But and that's because of the Tea Party. Because <laughs> the far right leading libertarian Tea Party, which has a very strong presence within the state legislature and who we made friends with during this last session, sees eye to eye with us with regards to privacy, with regards to overreach of big brother government, that sort of thing. So the environment is ripe for actually passing fairly substantial legislative change within Texas. And this next session is gonna be the one to do that uh, because all of the legislators are gonna be wanting to, um, well, let's also say that there's this relationship between Texas and the federal government also, where um, it's very easy to say, well, do you see it? Same way as Obama does with regards to intrusiveness and monitoring. Like, oh no no no! Uh, definitely don't want to have any sort of association. With that. So, um, to so to rip on John's idea about that and say like if we can actually just develop a a group of people who feel comfortable going down to the state legislature, talking with legislators, informing them about these subjects because that is one of the most important roles that we can play as technically um, inclined or intelligent people is to explain what it is that's actually happening because a lot of times I think your legislator who represents you is responsible for understanding not just the nuances of geolocation tracking but every issue and they don't have time to actually understand all of that. They don't have inclination to it. Their staffers are tasked with it on a piece by piece basis. They don't necessarily understand or have the time for it. And so, you going up and actually coaching people on this is very, very helpful and welcome. You, you will find that people are very receptive to actually having someone who is informed and. Um, about it all, come and tell them what it is that's actually happening with this particular piece of legislation and why it's presented. So, um, so I think that that piece is important, the, the possibility for actually doing legislative change at the state level here. I think we're just uniquely positioned for all of that. It's worth spending some time on. But I also want to take a moment and talk about something John and I talked about recently, which is that this shit's heavy. And that's not sustainable to be just concentrated on that shit all the time because it's, it's boring to a degree and it's just not entirely fun all the time. It's just sort of depressing after a while. And I think that's actually one of the big problems that EFF Boston has had is that it's kind of depressing after a while to look at the state of things and see that we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing, and she just seems to be getting fucking worse and worse, or we're finding out about how fucking bad it is. So I think that the reminder about how EFF Alston in its early days had this entire EFF Arts piece of the puzzle and the fact that John and Maggie know how to throw such good parties <laughs> is an important reminder that it can't all be negative Nelly stuff all the time because it's just no fun. Yeah, we want to revive that arts thing. We, and we have had some great parties. The, actually, Maggie and I were part of a, a thing called Plutopia that turned into really big events here, but it started as EFF parties. Uh, where actually Ed was involved. You remember the one that we did at Schultz Garden? That actually was, party. That was an amazing party, you know? There hadn't been very many like that. Uh, at EFF, I'm, I'm sorry, at South by Southwest, if you go, and I'm sure some of you have gone, if you go to the parties there, 
They're kind of boring, aren't they? I mean, you know, they're dum, 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 green, 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 green. Well, we were trying to do stuff that was different. It was really cool. It was crazy. And uh, um, we did some pretty interesting stuff. It turned out to be pretty resource intensive and hard to do and, you know, hard to sustain. But you can, you can shrink those down a little bit. I think we'll continue to do parties like that. And we may do other things throughout the year. Uh, occasionally, Cory Doctorow will come to town, or Bruce Sterling will come to town, and uh, we can build an event around having them speak or do a reading or something like that. So, I think it's also we're at a we're at a cool time culturally where um, you have stuff emerging like the entire maker community and scene and all the do do yourself approach to electronics and hardware and new creativity that's possible. And um, while there's other groups in town that are focused specifically on those sorts of things, um, I think that in general, there's, there's opportunities there as well, which uh, we haven't even really begun to explore. So just wanted to emphasize that piece about it all, where it's like, okay, well, we can talk a lot of talk about all how the world's going to shift and all of that, but you know, it's just, it's just not what's going to motivate people, I think is what I've observed every time. That's why people turn to tune out. After a while, it's all over here, so they just tune out. Yeah. It's so negative, I can't do anything about it, so I'll just mm -hmm. won't do anything about it. Yeah. So um, one thing that strikes me, though, is that, you know, I'm watching this tour challenge come across there on the EFF uh, site, is the ability to position ourselves with the universities, to be like, okay, let's help teach students about what you can do about to protect your, your own privacy. Um, and maybe even do it as a, as a fun event with like have a bunch of you know, onion cooking contests or something. <laughs> onion rings, you know, the onion theme about it and do a tour, you know, have stuff where you teach about tour. And there's, there's a group in town, um, which Corey is part of. Um, it's the local restore the fort. Um, group which has still maintained its existence since last Jan July 4th where all of them uh, were first were first formed and they have continued doing work coaching people on using privacy preserving tools on installing an email on what they were on or using the information and uh, they have done a great job of actually getting out there and coaching people on that stuff and we work together as much as possible for sure. So like I totally agree. I mean, especially because what we've seen emerge in the last year is just the complaints about the usability of these privacy preserving technologies and stuff. Okay, well, you know, Carl Zimmerman created PGP in the nineties and it's Still kind of hard to use. It's like, well, why don't we devote some fantastic startup minds and design resources um, that we're using to create these different tools and technologies now for some of these privacy preserving um, technologies? So I think that there's, there's definitely a need for that sort of thing. And I hope that the Restore the Fourth folks will. Been on hiatus lately because um, a lot of us have kind of turned out. Um, but we're working on coming back together and creating a plan for what we're going to do in the near future. Uh, probably some more events and community outreach. Um, we like to try and get people that normally don't know about this kind of stuff and teach them that stuff. So we're actually having a meeting uh, Thursday. Thank you, thank you. Let me check so I don't give people all the time. I believe it's two in the afternoon. Um, Cookie Picky is over on East 11th Street. That's a great group of folks. Uh, I've been just super pleased to see them continue doing the work that they're doing. They've done events also where they'll um, do movie screenings in town of films or documentaries that are relevant. It's just, again, that sort of convenient factor of bringing people together that are, that are interested in these particular subjects. 
their, their Twitter account's a good resource too. You guys keep it up to date if you want to like see what's going on. What's, what's the Twitter account name? Oh. Uh, RT4 Atex or? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not. If you look up RT4 Atex, you'll be able to get the resources from there. Um, anyway, the meeting will be 7 o'clock on Thursday. Um, restore fourth ATX. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Numeral four? Uh, the number four TH. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Oh, <laughs> that's great. Who's that? <laughs> that's a video of Greg giving a talk in front of the Capitol. So we can do stuff like that. Um, I had another uh, thing on here. Um, the reset the net thing was kind of interesting. What reset the net was about, and I know the sort of fourth was getting out of the state, um, was getting uh, people with use crypto tools. You know, instead of worrying about keeping the NSA out uh, through some centralized policy strategy, let's just build some walls around our data, you know? Uh, so there was, a, a, about a week ago, there was a day that was like a reset the net day, and there was uh, a lot of activity, companies doing things and so forth, all in the interest of, uh, making encryption more accessible and using it more. And I think like Google uh, strengthened their encryption and made it more uh, more widespread in their systems. So yeah, that, um, came out with a plug-in for uh, encryption for email uh, for, for Chrome. And Apple did something too, what did they do? Yeah, they, I can't remember, they randomized the, uh, I think ILC is gonna have randomized I can Max. see that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Back yeah. ID is a randomized yeah. stuff. Uh, uh, network sector. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, well, it's yeah. Right. Hey, here's a bit of business, folks. If you park in the garage, you can get one of these at validation and it'll get you out for less money. <laughs> so, people who are parked in the garage, let Ali know and he can that's basically validate your parking. It'll be $5 instead of the regular amount. And it's good until 6 a.m. So if you happen to go out after this, then you come back. <laughs> and you stumble back and. It's <laughs> 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Anybody else? Uh, I don't know. But why don't you get it up front? I don't think that will help. I'm going to just take a pass around and sign up. Cheap. So if you want to share contact information, uh, we will. We will get back in time. Well, once you go, we got second calendar day, you're right, let's say. So I guess, will, will it be reintroduced under the same um, order, like reference? So, if I remember correctly, I think the number was 2268, HB 2268. And um, so, geolocation privacy bill, um, just requiring, um, requiring a warrant signed by a judge for access to uh, the record of your geolocation information. Um, and it will be introduced pretty much largely um, as, as originally designed. Uh, there's some real good transparency requirements, reporting requirements um, about the number of requests that are made, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, so hopefully that will that one should be pretty easy. Yeah, I hope we had a we had a fun strategy with that one, uh, which we when you introduce a bill, you can have multiple co-signers on the bill, um, and usually it's like a really kind of one primary lead author, and maybe you'll have four other representatives that sign. So we had over 100 co-signers for the for the bill. So it's like before it even goes to the committee, it's like, okay, well, this gets out of committee, it's well, pretty yeah. much. So um, it's an interesting strategy when you've got the entire Tea Party wing of the legislature wanting to 
to rub it in the face slightly of uh, the other representatives there. So, anyways, yeah, that was a fun one. So, we could actually have another. Well, one thing, Ali said that we can use this room from, from now on. We're doing monthly meetings here. Um, you could help by bringing more people. Uh, and here. Uh, if we can have a meeting, and maybe our next meeting could be, it'd be good if we could get Scott in here to talk a little bit more about how the legislative action works so that we can kind of start getting our hands into it. Because it's, you know, that's not really that far away. It's something that we need to start planning and thinking about now. Uh, and, you know, we want to think about other things and we want to hear your ideas. Uh, the way EFF Austin originally worked, it hadn't been working as much like that lately because we just, you know, our activity has kind of been dead in the floor. Uh, but it used to be that people would bring us ideas for things that we could do. And uh, if, if somebody on the board was willing to sponsor it, I, you know, adopt it and see it through, then we'd do it. Uh, when Bruce Sterling was on the board, for instance, he, uh, actually nobody brought this idea to him, this was his own idea. He had a workshop, uh, what did we call that? Um, Ed, do you remember what that? It was the, the, the Gail Thackeray thing. It had a name. Huh? I have a t-shirt. Yeah, me, me too. Um, anyway. There was a woman named Gail Thackeray who was uh, cyber cops on uh, cyber. Uh, yeah, probably. doing the cyber cop thing. Bruce Sterling got really fascinated with the cops uh, when he was doing his research for Hacker Crackdown and talked to a bunch of them, and he started going to their conventions and hanging out with them, and got to know Gail Thackeray, who was uh, sort of a prime mover in Operation Sun Devil and uh, arranged this event where she came and, and talked to us at a workshop and kind of explained the operation to us and, uh, and we had, you know, that long q &A with her. We had an opportunity to kind of get inside of, of her head and, and, and get into the thinking behind uh, the their raids that they had. And I, I don't think anything on her watch was as egregious as the Steve Jackson raid. She was pretty aggressive. She was pretty aggressive. That's true. She was a very ambitious, I mean, we have these very ambitious DAs out there who would really push hard. And uh, they saw this as, uh, I mean, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They probably really thought there was a threat involved. I don't know. Um, they didn't really completely understand what was going on. If somebody tells you that somebody was breaking into the 911 system, 911 system, you, you'd probably be a little bit alarmed until you found out that it was uh, actually just a set of instructions that anybody could get for 10 bucks, which wasn't that at 10 bucks. Um, so um, for people who don't do or know technology, it's going to be very hard to understand how to create technology policy. And most legislators just don't know that much about technology. No? I've got a project proposal. Yeah. It's one I've been thinking about. I really we'll start running geeks for, for comics. <laughs> <laughs> That's an excellent idea. That's a much better idea than what I was going to suggest. <laughs> uh, so another one involved in um, not directly with the FF Austin. Uh, there is a oversight position for the Austin Regional Intelligence Center, which is uh, one of the local fusion centers that we have here in Austin. It, uh, it's active for the three counties in the area. And I think they're up to now 20 some odd partner agencies that participate in that particular fusion center. And so I found myself in a position on oversight over their privacy policy with four other people on this privacy policy advisory committee, which activists here in Austin, including the Texans for Accountable Government in 2009-2010, got the city council to pass 
in order to actually stand up this local fusion center. And from what I found, um, this committee structure um, is unique across all of the fusion centers from what I've seen. Um, and so it provides a window into um, the operations of the local fusion center. Um, so I've been, this has been since December that I'm in this position and I haven't really done anything with it yet because um, I'm just sort of figuring out what the lay of the land is looking like. So one of the things though that I've started to do in collaboration with uh, a reporter at the Austin Chronicle is to actually gather together all of the privacy policies that we can find for the different fusion centers. And so what I want to do is actually take that information and put it into like a repository on GitHub or like put some GitHub pages site up or something like that. So the information is somehow kind of machine readable. Like you take all of the different policy points and positions, the retention schedules, whatever it might be, like however you want to cut across this information across the fusion centers and make that accessible to anyone who wants to download that data from the repository, use it for research, use it for getting more transparency into the operations of the different fusion centers. Um, we've only been able to find policies for 70 of the centers. I think there's maybe on the order of um, 80 or maybe more, I'm not sure, um, which is interesting. So we don't even know how many different centers there are that have been stood up at the time since 9-11. Um, so uh, we have that opportunity, like we have um, that access into that world and I'd like to do something with that. So if you're interested in that piece of the puzzle, like getting more into the um, domestic intelligence, and that strange nether world between law enforcement and military intelligence, um, then come talk to me or if you have ideas for you, definitely let us know. So we'll see with that one. What other ideas do you all have? What, what probably had ideas that you've thought about here in the last year since you've been reading about everything that's been going on? Like, what do you what do you think about all this? Like, what? Well, I think it would be cool if we had like a monthly meeting here. Like the screens were like on and we could probably get more people as you know, the months go on. Like he was saying how it, part of it could be like learn how to use PGP, learn how to use Tor. There was an article uh, like Snowden threw a crypto party before he was a whistleblower and it seemed like a fun idea where he had like different people gave presentations to like journalists on how to use encryption. I think there was maybe some documentaries shown. We could have our projects just maybe kind of a, a monthly thing so people get in like a regular kind of habit of getting together versus just like finding random things to come up. Okay. I actually had a we'll weekly it. meeting in Oak Hill defunct. Uh, yes. Okay, yes. We did. Um, my, my wife and I agreed to eat pizza every Friday night. <laughs> for, we said we were going to do it in here. But after six months of pizza, <laughs> it's Friday night. It was excellent pizza, but it's awesome pizza garden. I highly recommend it. Um, but we did a weekly meetup there and just would have dinner together with folks and uh, talk about everything from, of course, the latest that was still in the thick of all the revelations and stuff, but, you know, quantum information communication, you know, like whatever. That's the thing that I found useful in that entire exercise and endeavor was that you're just providing a venue for community to form. And I think that's one of the pieces that we've been trying to figure out and missing. It's like, well, how do you create a context where the community, which doesn't self-identify as such and doesn't need to self-identify as such, but for it even to happen. And so doing monthly meetings like that I think is what we should do. Yeah. Yeah, we can do it here. Yeah, this is better because it's more sensitive. Is this going to be the third Monday? Time getting to feel like yeah, that. it's real for ourselves. Ali said that he thought we could get the third Monday on a pretty regular basis, so 
Yeah, I think that will work. I'm going to confirm with him, and then we'll get the word out. Is that uh, the same as techno activism third Mondays? Is that, is I that don't know. We should discuss whether we're in conflict with anybody that we don't want to. Well, that would be an overlap. That would be perfect. I mean, it's bad enough that we're in conflict with soccer, with World Cup soccer. <laughs> oh my God. So, if you go to our website. Here, subscribe to the EFF Austin discussion list. And incidentally, there's a lot of information about EFF Austin on the website, including our kind of nice uh, mission statement. And, there, and there's a really cool yellow button that says donate on it. Yeah, really and actually, awesome. if you want to donate tonight, <laughs> if you want to donate tonight, the lady with the green blouse back there will take your donations. She has a cuff there that you can drop donations one. in. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, I mean, we don't, we don't raise a lot of money, we don't spend a lot of money. We're beginning to understand that if we could raise a little bit more money, we could probably do a lot more stuff. So we're gonna try to get better at that. Uh, but you can sign up here. There's also, <coughs> do we still have Nation Builder running? I don't know if we were gonna if we're gonna continue that or not. We had something called Nation Builder that we were trying out that was uh, a little more structured way of doing things, but uh, I think we're not gonna use it for now. So if you just sign up for our discuss list, you'll be up to date on what's going on, and you can you know you can visit the site and see what's happening. We keep it pretty well up to date. But you can see that our mission here is EFF Austin advocates establishment and protection of digital rights and defense of the wealth of digital information, innovation, and technology. We promote the right of all citizens to communicate and share information without unreasonable constraint. We also advocate the fundamental right to explore, tinker, create, and innovate along the frontier of emerging technologies. And we spent a lot of time writing that thing, and I, I think it still stands, and it's still pretty good. Though if you have suggestions, you could always mind them. Um, so this has been actually a great meeting, and uh, we really appreciate everybody who has showed up tonight. And let's hang out a little bit and talk some more and drink a little more beer. And uh, We probably ought to be out of here in 15 or 20 minutes. So thanks. That one is uh, in DC, EFF. Huh? You still have one a chapter in DC, also in DC? There's no other chapters in the world. We're in a, oh, you know, somebody told me the other day that there might be a chapter in Switzerland, but I don't know about that. I think we're it. Actually, uh, we were a little bit reticent about that. I mean, we don't, we tried really hard to avoid getting confused. You know, people thinking that we are EFF or anybody giving us money thinking that's going to national EFF or so forth. And we worry and worried about that and we'd always explain to people very painfully how we're really not formally part of EFF and so on and so on. And then Corey Doctorow showed up the last time he was in town and he said, this is the only chapter of EFF in the world. And he said, well, you know, okay. <laughs> So we're kind of a chapter of EFF, but we're not really. They don't give us any money, and we don't give them any money. <laughs> Nas National EFF does do a lot of events in DC, though, because okay. they have a presence there because it's Washington DC. Yeah. I, I thought the federal law always trumps state law. You want to make changes? <laughs> Maybe doing national no, level, no. not about state level. Well, You're a Tea Party guy, you figure state law trumps federal law. State law is effective for, for agents of the state. So state law is effective for state and local law enforcement. So for instance, they have to get a warrant to look at email. Whereas federal law enforcement still abides by federal law and still just needs a subpoena. So it just needs their DA to, uh, to write a piece of paper. So, yeah.